Our scripture reading this morning as we continue on in the Gospel of Mark is going to come from Mark 12, picking up in verse 18 through 37. And it reads, Some Sadducees, some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, If a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no child, the man shall marry the widow and raise up the children for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first married, and when he died, left no children. And the second married the widow and died, leaving no children. And the third likewise, none of the seven left children. Last, last of all, the woman herself died. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Is not this the reason <laughs> Jesus said to them, Is not this the reason you are wrong? That you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the story about the bush how God said to them, I am the God of Abraham, the God of, Oz, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is God not of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing what he answered them, that he answered them well, he asked him, uh, Which commandment is first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribes and said to him, You are right. Teacher, you have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other, and to love him with all your heart, and with all the understanding, with all your strength, and to love one's neighbor as yourself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to them, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any questions. While Jesus was teaching in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David. David himself, by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how can he be his son? And the large crowd was listening to him with delight. May God add a blessing to the reading, to the hearing, and the living of his holy word. Thanks be to God. Simple quick message for you this morning two main points that I want to make. Jesus enters Jerusalem in the Gospel of Mark, and, uh, and there's this kind of long period of Jesus in Jerusalem before we start moving into the Passion narrative, which we start getting into next week in our series. But the first is this. When Jesus enters Jerusalem, he makes a lot of imagery about Jerusalem being a vineyard, he, in, 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 and it's specifically tied to uh, the language that we see in Isaiah with God talking about God's people and being a vineyard, uh, more specifically, and that it was God's vineyard. Jesus told these stories about God's vineyard in Jerusalem when he got there to the sad response of people who assumed that they had the right to rebuke or refuse Jesus based on their titles or, the, or their positions. It's a common theme throughout the book of Mark for someone to ask Jesus, by what authority do you say these things? But Jesus loved the people of Jerusalem, but their leaders didn't necessarily reciprocate. As they plotted his death, Jesus pointedly exposes the murder that is within their hearts and their questionings. We see that when Jesus enters Jerusalem, there is this hate-filled atmosphere amongst these leaders that surrounded Jesus in his last week of life. And we're tempted to despise in this book, to read this and despise Jerusalem's leaders and often attribute them to the leaders that we don't like within our own Jerusalems today, or here in the United States, for instance. We're tempted to despise these leaders and see them in our book, but like them, Frankly, friends, uh, Lent is less a time of us pointing fingers instead of turning inwards, and we have blind spots the same, and we're meant to read these texts, realizing that each of us in our own lives have blind spots. Is there anything in God's Spirit that is nudging you to face honestly in your life? Do you have the courage to face it? To grant Jesus the authority, by what authority? The authority to guide you, intending to the very vineyard of your heart. The temple priests and legal ex experts held all the visible human power in the temple. What they said 
goes. Why didn't they just arrest Jesus there on that spot? Why did they play these little cat and mouse games with Jesus? Well, truly it says that they were afraid of the crowd of what maybe what happened. So they had to connive just a little bit. And Jesus knew the crowd could be wrong. But in this case, they saw more clearly than the religious leaders. And so oftentimes in our lives, you know, we see it later, the crowd we know is going to get it wrong when they shout out, crucify him, when given the chance by Pilate to release Barabbas or to release Jesus instead of Barabbas. We know the crowd gets it wrong, but there are cases in Mark where the crowd actually gets it right and the Pharisees get it wrong. And I like this in Mark and that there are very few, very clear answers in Mark, other than that there's the primacy of the cross, Jesus Christ as, the, as, the, Jesus Christ as God's Son, lifted up in glory on the cross. But the rest of it, this arguing, these tricky hypotheticals and great commandments uh, that we start getting into back in Mark 12 and the passage that I just rep, it can just be a bit confusing. It's a bit long passage. I apologize, but I kind of did that on purpose because when you start to hear these kind of arguments, you're kind of, you kind of forces you to ask this question like, why is any of this important? Jesus' enemies kept posing no-win questions in which, to, in which either answer would cause him trouble to maybe try to get the crowds on their sides. Later, they would ask about taxes. It's going to be a hot button issue. But instead of a simple yes or no answer, Jesus said that there was a valid realm for Caesar, human leaders. And in that realm, we should pay taxes and obey our earthly leaders. But God's kingdom rules over all human authority. And that Jesus identified the great commandments that govern that kingdom. And the call for us is ultimate loyalty to that kingdom above all else. There's this argument that's going to happen about whether or not people are raised from the dead. They're going to pose some crazy hypothetical and tricky question of what happens if a woman marries seven times all those brothers and what happens. And you heard it. It's a bit confusing. The Sadducees didn't necessarily believe in a resurrection and tried hard to make the whole idea sound pretty silly. But Jesus replied, not with a full picture of eternal life. He trusted God's power to work that out. But by denying their theory, had earthly limits still apply in eternity? My question to you is, what made the conviction that death was not the end, that the worst thing is never the last thing in our lives, vital as Jesus came near to the cross? To hear the words of Jesus, Jesus aptly responds back to their argument about, about who you know, belongs to who and the, uh, after someone dies, and he kind of lifts their questions, their tricky hypothetical questions, right out of the muck and gives the conviction out there that death is not the end, that these things don't exist, that there's another realm here that you don't see past the earthly things, and that the worst thing in life that you can only see right now is not the last thing. And that Jesus said this just days from going to the cross. Scholar William Barclay said that there are two theories amongst rabbis at this time. Some people believe that there was a lighter and weightier matters of the law, great principles in which were all important to grasp. Others held that the very smallest principle was equally binding. But when asked, it's important for Christians to realize that Jesus was quite clear here. He saw some principles as far more central than others to understanding God's will in our life. And we hear that passage that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, and that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. And it is by this that we'll be known as Christians. This is the weightier matter of the law. Last question I pose to you this Lenten season is that what are the implications of Jesus' answer for how you live out your life as a Christian, specifically how you read this book? Because the truth is, I haven't been a pastor very long. We've been going on about five years now. But I have probably spent more time wasted having arguments just like the one that the Sadducees and Jesus are following in this book. Only to be reminded time and time and time again of what's truly important. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. If only we had the bravery to let that guide us, instead of just sometimes our propensity to want to be right. Friends, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may that great principle guide you in your daily life and the week ahead. And we'll see you back here next week. Have a great week.